Thank you. First of all, I'm really honored today to be in front of you. And I think every one of us, he hold a big responsibility. What we are facing now, a human tragedy. And I think the human life is quite precious to be protected. Everywhere, everyone, he has the right to have his life, to have his free will, to express his opinion without any fear, not to live in such dictatorial regime, whatever they are in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia, wherever they are. I propose to the United Nations to kick those dictators from such places. It's really disgusting. Libya to be the chairman of Human Rights Committee in the United Nations. Shame on you, Libya. Shame on you, Gaddafi. The standards of human rights in Libya means not to open your mouth against, against the dictator or his regime. You must shut up. You must obey the order. You must follow the leader. This is the Libyan human rights standards. Every one of you recognize everything happened in the session on Friday, 17th of April. I was in front of the International Committee trying to tell them the suffering of my colleagues, mine too, and my family. I would like now to share with you what I was not able to tell. And right now I will not say thank you, Madam Chair. She doesn't even deserve that. But I am really honored to be with those people who are working for this. I don't know if you recognize me. I am the Palestinian medical intern who was scapegoated by your country, Libya, in the HIV case in Benghazi Hospital together with the five Bulgarian nurses. Section one of the draft declaration for this conference speaks about victims of racism, discrimination, xenophobia, and intolerance. Based on my own suffering, I wish to offer some proposals. Starting in 1999, the five nurses and I were falsely arrested, prosecuted, imprisoned, brutally tortured, convicted and sentenced to death three times. All of this, which lasted for nearly a decade, was for one reason, because the Libyan dictatorial regime was looking to scapegoat foreigners, nothing more. If that is not discrimination, then what is? On the basis of my personal experience, I would like to propose the following amendments regarding remedies, redress, and compensatory measures. One, the United Nations should condemn countries that scapegoat, falsely arrest, and torture vulnerable minorities. Two, Countries that have committed such crimes must recognize their past and issue an official public and unequivocal apology to the victims. Three, in accordance with Article 2, Paragraph 3 of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, such 
countries must provide victims of discrimination with an appropriate remedy, including adequate compensation for material and immaterial damages. Libya told this conference that it practices no inequality or discrimination. But then, how do you account what was happened and what was done to me, to my colleague, to my colleagues and to my family? My family who gave over 30 years serving your country, Libya, only to be kicked from their home, threatened with death, and subjected to a daily state terrorism. How, you can, how can your government chair the planning committee for a world conference on discrimination when it is on the list of the world's worst of the worst when it comes to discrim discrimination and human rights violations? When will your government recognize their crimes? Apology to me and to my colleagues and to our families who suffered for nearly a decade and give us our raped innocence. Do victims have any rights in your country? Do I have any rights? Even that right, I was not having it in front of the international community. It's really a big shame. This is the standards of human rights in Libya. Right now, as much as my lawyer, Mrs. Zegfeld, explained the things, my colleague, Christiana Falciva, she also explained. I will just make a very small brief. I will not take that long time. You know, I, in 1999, when I was captured, and as my colleague, she said, kidnapped. It was nothing more than because all of us, we were in the wrong place in the wrong time. And we had a hard luck. Anyone, he was able to be the victim of that schizophrenic dictator and his soldiers. I was just a Palestinian refugee. I have no state behind me to, def to defend me, and I think my colleagues too. I am right now a Bulgarian, and I am proud of that. <laughs> but at that time, Bulgaria was not neither nor, neither a member of the European Union nor a member of the NATO. That's why they had the chance. We were accused as uh, agents of Mossad and CIA. We were accused as agents. Then we were accused as agents of some international company for the medicine. And we are trying to inject the children and after that creating some type of medicine for the HIV. Then we were accused in the third uh, court that we are uh, some crazy people who are trying just to inject the children with HIV. The case was known as HIV case, which is not a, a true. The truth was it's a nosocomial infection, a triple viral infection in the Benghazi hospital. It's HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Unfortunately, in such dictatorial regimes, if the leader, he said that the cause of AIDS, it comes from bugs, you must believe it. And as a scientist, you must prove that, that the bugs, it's responsible for the HIV. And everyone must follow the leader, because the leader, he's the first doctor, he's the first engineer, he's the first lawyer, he is the first one, he is the king of the kings of Africa. You know, I think he is the second pharaoh for this century. So, um, we had a horrible torture. We were facing each other even in front of the torture. 
we were tortured in front of each other, mostly naked, with electricity, with a magic machine, like this they called it, the magic machine. It was having a very big effect. We were completely isolated, nor a family knows about us, neither a lawyer with us to defend our rights. My family, for complete 10 months, doesn't know anything about me, if I am alive or dead. I was captured in 29th of January, 99. The first time they were having the access to see me, it was 29th of November, 99. They didn't recognize me. I was a completely different one. And when I start to say to them that I was tortured, and my colleagues too, they just separate us. It was a, a couple of minutes. That torture I received, it was, as I said to you, by electricity mostly, finally by the police dogs. I will not talk about just beating or hanging or deprivation of food or sleep or whatever. Maybe sometimes it can be handled. I don't know. Finally, they were threatened me that they will torture my family in front of me. I was really scared of that. They did worse than this. They raped me by a police dog. And at that time, when I resist their own scenario, the only thing that they proposed to me either to rape my sister in front of me or to sign or to accept their own scenario. I did that. I accept that. Even I said to them, if you want that, I am the one who is responsible for Banam, American, I am the one who is responsible for that. I was accused like an agent of Mossad and CIA. Even they said that you are not a Muslim, you are a Jewish, you are a Christian, maybe, because really, as a Palestinian, there is a big community, they are Christians. And the king of the kings of Africa, he is the leader of the dialogue between the religions. And this is what he is teaching his soldiers to tell. Our case was given as an example to, uh, to all the Arab media from the Libyan side as a Christianity against the, the Islam. Because most of, all of my colleagues, they are Christians, and I am a Muslim. And they were pressing over that, that the Christian nurses who are coming behind the seas, they came to inject the Libyan children with HIV. They have enough, enough HIV in their own country. And they know, I think, the cause. Right now, the Libyan government or the Libyan authorities recognize that they have more than 480 children with hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And they refer this number to our time, to 1999, which was the evidence what uh, Professor Montigny and Coulisi, they gave to the court, but they didn't accept. My family was threatened to death. They were kicked, my sisters, they were kicked out from the universities because they are the sisters of the criminal who inject the Libyan children. I would also add something that I will not stop. I will be and remain until the last moment of my life as a stone in their throats. Thanks to Holland, who saved this, the lives of my family. Thanks to Bulgaria, who saved my life. Thanks to the European Union and United States of America. Thanks to Mr. Solomon Passy, 
who was the ex-foreign minister of Bulgaria. He's a Jewish. He's the first one who offered me a help, and I'm a Palestinian. It was a very dramatic moment when the expected enemy is offering me a help. I was like somebody who was in the, in the prison of his brother, of his big brother. I was like this. I was believing in that idiot's ideology once. But when I was in the prison, just I, a Jewish man, he offered me a help. I will not forget that forever until the last moment of my life. I'm really thankful for your care and listening to me.